And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Syria is seeing some of the worst violence of the 11-month uprising against Bashar al-Assad amidst an ongoing international standoff over how to respond. Assad's forces have launched what appears to be one of their fiercest assaults on the flashpoint city of Homs to date. Witnesses say dozens of people have been killed in shelling and rocket fire that's reportedly struck residential areas and at least one field hospital. There are widespread fears Assad's regime is launching the attacks in preparation for a full-scale ground invasion of Homs. Both the U.S. and Britain have closed their embassies in Damascus, the Syrian capital, and withdrawn diplomatic personnel, citing safety fears. As the crisis escalates, Russia and China are facing criticism for blocking a U.N. Security Council resolution backed by the United States and Arab League, calling for a political transition in Syria. On Monday, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Susan Rice, stood by her previous claim of being disgusted by the Russian and Chinese vote. The fact that Russia and China chose to align themselves with a dictator who's on, on his last legs, rather than the people of Syria, rather than the people of the Middle East, and rather than the principled views of the rest of the international community, was indeed disgusting and shameful. Uh, and I, I think that uh, over time, it is a decision they'll come to regret when there is a democratic Syria that won't forget this action. Meanwhile, in Washington, State Department spokesperson Victoria Nuland said the U.S. will now pursue a response to the Syrian crisis outside of the U.N. in light of the standoff with Russia and China. Nuland also urged Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov to press for Assad's departure during his visit to Damascus. In a situation where the Security Council has been blocked from acting in support of the Arab League plan, in support of the defense of a democratic path for Syria, we're going to have to take measures outside the U.N. to strengthen and deepen and broaden the international community of pressure on Assad. Our hope and expectation is that Foreign Minister Lavrov will use this opportunity to make absolutely clear to the Assad regime how isolated it is uh, and to encourage Assad and his people to make use of the Arab League plan and provide for a transition. For their part, Russia and China say the U.N. resolution was too one-sided and would have dangerously emboldened anti-government fighters. In response, Syria's main opposition group, the Syrian National Council, said it would hold Russia and China, quote, responsible for the escalating acts of killing. The Assad regime, meanwhile, has denied committing atrocities, says it's fighting foreign-backed armed groups. Speaking to Reuters, Syria's, Syria's cultural attaché in Washington, Rua Shabaji, said the Assad regime has been responsive to protesters' demands, but has been forced to battle militants that have hijacked their cause. The picture in Syria right now is very much different from the picture uh, all the media around the world are trying to portray it. Uh, the Syrian government acknowledged uh, legitimate demands of uh, the people there, and uh, there's a lot of reforms going on. Uh, we have a lot already achieved, and we are working on the others. So there's a political process ongoing in Syria. But at the same time, uh, this demands and this uh, people movement have been hijacked with unarmed groups and terrorists, and no country in the world, even the U.S., will tolerate uh, such uh, incidents on its ground, because the responsibility of uh, the government is, first and foremost, to, secure, to ensure the security and safety of the people and to maintain law and order in the country. The crisis in Syria has revived the foreign intervention debate that surrounded the Arab Spring uprisings of the past year. While the U.S. leads calls for Assad's departure, critics have pointed out its backing of longtime allies in Yemen, Bahrain and Egypt, despite the repression of peaceful protesters in all three countries. The fears over intervention in Syria are compounded by the memories of Libya, where NATO countries used a U.N. Security Council mandate for the protection of civilians to help overthrow the Gaddafi regime. Well, to discuss the situation in Syria, we're going to London, where we're joined by Patrick Seale, leading British writer on the Middle East. He's author of Assad, The Struggle for the Middle East, which is about the current president's father, and most recently, the struggle for Arab independence. We welcome you to Democracy Now!, Patrick. Um, can you talk about what's happening right now in Syria and the United Nations? Well, 
Well, Amy, I think to understand what's happening, one has to see that it's not a simple matter. It's at least a two or possibly a three-stage crisis. Internally in Syria, the situation is getting worse by the day. It's a very ugly struggle. It's been reduced to something like kill or be killed, and we can explain that in a second. At a higher level, there's a struggle between the United States on the one hand and its allies and its opponents like Russia and China. And so it, that is a struggle for regional dominance. Who is to be top dog? Then there's a third level, possibly, of Arab Gulf states like Qatar, for example, and even Saudi Arabia behind it, who are obsessed and worried by Iran. And they think that Iran might stir up uh, Shia communities in the region, the eastern province of Saudi Arabia, in Bahrain, in Yemen, and challenge the existing political order. So it's a multi-stage crisis. And for what's happening at the United Nations, the motivations for Russia and China to veto the U.N. Security Council resolution, talk about the significance of this. Well, it's of great significance, and there's a whiff of a new Cold War about it. You see, Russia has decades-long interests in the Middle East, and particularly in Syria. During the time of Bashar al-Assad's father, uh, during the Cold War, in fact, China is a leading customer for Iranian oil and is very much uh, objects to American sanctions and European sanctions on Iran's oil exports. China is, of course, not overjoyed by American attempts to contain its influence in the Asia-Pacific region, which President Obama has spoken about a great deal. And so these two powers, what are they saying by their vetoes? They're saying they don't, expect, they don't accept American and Israeli hegemony over the Middle East. They say they have interests there, too, and they want their interests to be addressed and to be respected. And Russia's interest here, um, Russia selling Syria um, millions of dollars worth of weapons. Well, I mean, small, small, small uh, amounts compared to what America supplies Israel with. You see, I think to understand what's happening, one has to see this as a concerted attack, assault on not only Syria but Iran as well. Uh, you see. Uh, Iran, Syria, and their ally Hezbollah in Lebanon, that trio, a sort of Tehran-Damascus-Hezbollah axis, has in recent years been the main obstacle to American and Israeli hegemony in the Middle East. And the attempt now is to bring that axis down. Of course, they're fighting back with, with, their, with their allies, with their friends, like precisely like Russia and China. So that's what we're seeing on that level. Internally in Syria is a completely different struggle. Now, you see, the, the main element in the opposition, the main, the most powerful element in the Syrian National Council is the, Mus is the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, we, just the other day, they celebrated the 30 year anniversary of the assault on Hama by Hafez al-Assad. The, the, the father of the present uh, president. And in that struggle, uh, at least 10,000 people were killed in the city of Hama. Now, we have to understand the background of that. Hama, in 1982, was the climax of a terrorist campaign by the Muslim Brothers, which began in the late 70s, to overthrow the Assad regime at that time. And uh, they seized control, the insurgents seized control of Hama, uh, butchered Ba'ath Party uh, members and officials. And it was only at that stage that the regime moved in and crushed that ins insurgency and killed a lot of, uh, of people, a lot of innocent people. Now, the specter of what happened then, 30 years ago, hangs over the present situation. And the Muslim Brothers, they've been outlawed for the last 30 years. They've suffered all sorts of problems at the hands of the regime, and they are thirsting for revenge. So that's why I'm saying it's, it's kill or be killed. The present government feels that these are armed insurgents, and the mistake of the opposition was, in fact, to resort to, to arms. And as we heard a moment ago from, I think, a Syrian spokesman there, that any 
government, whatever its political coloring, will, cease, will, 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 will seem justified in putting down an armed insurrection in its territory. We're going to break and then come back to this discussion. Patrick Seal is our guest, leading British writer in the Middle East, author of the book Assad, The Struggle for the Middle East, which is about Hafez al-Assad, the father of the current president of Syria, and most recently has written The Struggle for Arab Independence, Riyadh al-Sol, and the makers of the modern Middle East. This is Democracy Now! Back in a minute.